Good morning and happy Sabbath, Culver City. Thank you so much. We have truly enjoyed ourselves this morning. And Lord have mercy, it's more than 40 degrees, so we're good. <laughs> My church members were texting me this morning and calling at 7 o'clock. There's, I can't get outside. <laughs> it's snow and ice and what do we do? I said, be safe. Just, we'll, we'll cancel church if we have to. Uh, you've lived here a lot longer than I have, so go ahead and cancel it. I'm having sunshine where I am and I don't want to rub it in. But uh, we are grateful to be here today. And uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know your pastor, Pastor Callie. <laughs> And uh, the story is a little interesting, how God works in his mysterious ways. Uh, good to see some familiar faces here, the dents, all right. Altadena days, Lord have mercy. Can I pick on Brother Dent real quick? So uh, y'all may think he's really nice, and, and he, but he, he used to be a rebel rouser back in his day. He may still be, I don't know, but uh, she's, uh, she's testifying, uh-oh, she's testifying. I don't have to hold up on that one, but... Uh, I remember growing up as a youth at the Altadena Church, and we had our little uh, youth choir, and I remember we would try to get our little, you know, your little, your little Jesus clap and your little Jesus sway, and some of the folks in the audience would be like, ooh, that's a little too much joy for the Lord. I take it down a notch. And uh, Brother Dent one day came up there with a full drum trap set, and we're like, yes! And it was just a blessing. He always had our back, and he really pushed us to enjoy the gifts that God has given folks at church. Music is an instrument, and you are the vessel. If you are connected to God, it is a godly thing coming out of that instrument. If you're doing it for your own will, then we need to worry. But I always appreciate you standing up for the young folks at Altadena and forcing us to add a little this to our moves. Thank you. I, I remember that, and I was young. I remember that. I remember that. Uh, so your pastor, just quickly, I wanted to share with him, uh, back in 20, share with you all, back in 2012, I believe it was, I was at the Altadena Church, which is really interesting. God has a sense of humor. I ended up being an, a pastor at the church I grew up in, and man, I could relate when Jesus said, the prophet gets no love in his hometown, boy. Have mercy, have mercy. People were like, hey, little Eustace, I remember you, and I used to pop you upside your head. And I was like, I'm taller than you now. Please don't, don't call me little. Like, I've got hair on my face. Come on now. <laughs> Jeez Louise, man. But finally got to the point where things were moving and grooving there, and uh, the conference officials told me they were going to move me to uh, Breath of Life in Inglewood. And I put up a fight, said, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I'm finally getting somewhere. I don't want to go. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. And the boss said, well, look, I'm glad you spoke your mind. I said, thank you. I feel good. I stood up for myself, spoke my mind. If you want a job, you will go. I said, all right, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go, boy. I'm ready to go. So I, I remember word had gotten out at Breath of Life that I was coming, and they were like, we don't want him. And I was like, I don't want you, you know? Forget y'all. You know, you're not going to hurt me. I don't want you. And they're like, we want this guy, Callie. I was like, I don't even know who Callie is, but you can have him for all I, I don't, I don't <laughs> take him. Yeah. So it's funny how things get back to you. He's nice and tall. I was like, so you're saying I'm short? It's like, Jesus loves you too. Like, man, I tell you. I'm tall in heart where it counts. <laughs> Never met the man at the time. So they still sent me there. And lo and behold, I would say all those motions happening probably brought you to the West region and possibly brought you here. So I guess if I had fought a little harder and said I wouldn't go, they would have sent you to Inglewood and y'all never would have been blessed with the man. So you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> so as you can see, and good morning church family, it is wonderful to be here. Is my mic on? Okay. Um, so your pastor, yes, he did make a mistake at that pastor's meeting when he sat at our table because as you can see, my husband's a cut up. And since we've been together, I think it's been five or six years now. See, I'm, I'm the one in the relationship that's like, I don't remember our anniversary. Sure the doesn't. important part is we got married. That's that what, what you should celebrate every day. 
And so I'm like, August, that's the month. And then I was like, I got to call my mom. And I was like, hey, so when did you spend all that money on our wedding? Okay. And then I, you know, can plan and prepare so and what all day that is it? good stuff. What day is it? Put you on the spot. What day in August? Oh, it's um, the 6th. <laughs> Eight, yeah, last year six. she kind of forgot. I'm yeah, I might have accidentally forgotten. So um, we Pray are happy us. to be here this morning and to share God's word in, uh, in, a, in a new and in interesting way for us. We've done, I think this is our first time actually doing a sermon yes, together. Um, and so we kind of wanted to do it a little bit differently. Um, but you will probably experience that uh, we will egg each other on up here. And we don't really know how long this is going to be. So I hope you ate breakfast. And I hope who's ever in charge of potluck is going to start warming that up and watch the dinner roast very carefully <laughs> so that it doesn't burn. Um, so, but no, when, when Callie invited us, we were excited. And so we spent from 9 a.m. in the morning. I think the meeting ended up, oh, it went ex exceptionally long that day. Oh my yes. goodness, it was like an all day pastor's meeting. And um, people kept, we had this assignment that we had to do. Like, we don't do assignments, we're adults. And um, we didn't do it very well because we spent more time laughing about the assignment and what was going on than actually doing it. And so um, we got to know each other really well that day, but it was absolutely a lot of fun. And today, um, our sermon title, uh, we were, you know, we're talking about out of Ephesians, um, this marriage dynamic and mm -hmm. relationship dynamic. And so I was thinking about the sermon title this week, and I was like, I, I proposed it first to my mother. I said, what do you say, what do you think of what's love got to do with it? You know the song, like, what's love got to do with it? Yeah, okay, I can't She's sing. She's not a singer. So that is as good as it gets right there. And then my mom said, she started laughing. She's like, um, well, you better hope that you have a broad generational age in your congregation because everybody your age and younger won't know what that song is. So, <laughs> but it seems like you guys do. So you're with me. You're already following me. So I'm going to open us up with prayer this morning. And can I just say thank you to Harry, Harry for reading Did we that pronounce scripture? that right? Yeah, I saw so, your face when you saw how long it was. He's like, seriously, people? But you made me win the bet this week. Yes. So we went back and forth we did. because he said the scripture is too long. I said, people need to know how to read. Okay. This is basic <laughs> reading skills. And so he said, no, 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 nobody reads that many verses in church anymore. And I mm -hmm. said, well, maybe that's wrong with church that there's not enough people reading enough scripture. And so <laughs> she did say there's that. a little old school part in me. So when you stepped up, you read the scripture, you didn't stumble, not once your eyes did get big at like how many verses you were reading, but you did awesome. So thank you for making me a winner. And I'd just like to point out, she disobeyed the scripture by not submitting to my will and decided to, ah, uh, there we go. I, and ah. now bow your heads with me as we so you, invite you the Lord into this, this space one more time. <laughs> Dear Lord, we actually just want to come and say thank you so much that, um, we have the opportunity to study your word and that your word is dynamic and amazing and it speaks to various areas of our lives because of the depth of love that you have for us. And so I just thank you uh, so much for this opportunity to worship and to spend time uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ here this morning and just uh, speak through us, Lord, this morning and continue to teach us and mature us in your perfect love. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to read just a few opening verses of our text this morning from the New King James Version. And it says, I actually really don't actually read from the New King James Version too much, but today it'll work. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, 
as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be their own, uh, be to their own husband in everything. So honestly, when I first read, thank you, when I, thank you, when I first read this text, it makes me a little angry. Because I'm, I'm going to be honest with you all, I'm a strong-willed woman. Uh, my mama taught me how to think for myself and make my own decisions. And when I first read this text years ago, um, I was like, I shall submit to no man. That's a pretty powerful word that in scripture is being asked of a woman. And it's like, you spent three verses telling me that I need to do, like, do this. And as I have grown in my relationship with the Lord and in my relationship of understanding how scripture works, and we're going to unpack some of it today, I, my understanding of what this type of submission has deepened and it has broadened. However, there is still, uh, even in preparing for this sermon this week, we sat down and uh, there's other texts, there's some in Colossians and in Peter um, that, you know, talk about, you know, what wives need to do, right? I'm like, you're not going to tell me what to do. Um, and he, Eustace asked me, he said, so what are you thinking right now? I was like, I am angry and my heart is racing. And it's not because of what is the scripture is asking. It is because when I read this text, I, I hear and I see and I have experienced what other people try to make of the text. And I, ex I experience when someone says, uh, in, a, in, a, in the terms of being submissive and subversive and this authority, positional type of submission that woman, you're supposed to obey me and then they go to scripture and they put this text on top of it and we take our societal positional standing and then we, you know, do a horrible job and we go to scripture and then see, see, God's backing me up. That's what makes me angry about this text. But we want to spend some time together understanding and unpacking even more what it is that God is really asking us to do because I have to ask myself, is the scripture really saying woman know her place? Or is it much more profound and deeper? And is that a fair representation of the reflection of God's love? Or have we sometimes made it a very unchristlike representation? Watch out now. As I reflect on this passage, I remember being a teenager and first coming across it and thinking, oh wow, so I get to, uh, eventually one day I'm gonna get married and I'm supposed to boss my wife around. Clearly that it's not working not out. That does not go over very well. Clearly it doesn't work very well. Uh, she didn't even listen to me about the scripture. But it was interesting because I grew up in a strong black mother home, a strong black woman, and I saw, I can't really say, I never saw my mom push my dad around. I never saw my dad push my mom around and boss her around and tell her what to do. But at the same time, I saw a mother who worked, a career woman, um, bragged that she got her PhD before I got my master's. I was like, thanks a lot, mom. Hurts a little bit, but you know. But someone who is dedicated to God, but using, as well as using all of her talents. And I was like, okay, so maybe I'm missing something with the surface reading of this text. Maybe God is asking us to dig a little deeper and to see what he's really asking in this passage. And by no means are we both going to stand up here and say, oh, this is a really easy, fun passage just to get on through. There are some things you have to wrestle with with this text. Uh, as I got older, and thank the Lord for wisdom with age, 
uh, the text started to grow. And I noticed that section about what God is asking husbands to do. And yikes, it's a tall task. And we're going to get to that a little later. He, it's not a walk in the park for husbands. It's not sit on your nice reclining chair and dictate to everyone in your household. He's calling men to be like Christ. Yikes. We'll get to that. Well, what about your oh, I'm gonna tell breakfast? You. I'm going to tell you about breakfast. This is recently. My, yes. This one is actually of my very recent. Stories. I was meeting, and to go with what she was talking about, how people have taken this passage to mean what they want it to mean. I met with a pastor in Tehachapi, different denomination, and he shared with me. I joined this men's group, multi denominational men's group, trying to get to know the folks in the town, see what's going on. And uh, this pastor mentioned to me, he said, you know, just keep me in prayer with my wife. Uh, my wife, she's in school at UCLA, and, and she, you know, I have, to, I have to keep her in check. I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. He said, I have to keep her in check. All right. He said, yeah, you know, the Bible says I am the priest of the home, and she's to submit to me. And, and you know what? I'm not good with finances. She's much better with finances, but she has to understand that since I'm the priest of the home, she's got to submit the family finances to me. So I was like, so wait a minute. I said, just, you know, I'm sitting in the morning eating, and I was like, hold up. <laughs> Let me make sure I, I heard you correctly. You're telling me your wife is better with managing the bills and the finances of the home. He's like, yeah. You won't let her do it because you feel, as the priest of the home, that falls under you. He said, yeah. I said, that's a strange idea. Uh, why don't you just let her do the finances so you can stop upsetting her and the rest of the family by messing up the finances? Because your hips can't add. <laughs> you don't even know if you're about to overdraw or not. And he said, he, his prayer request was help me in my home because of the financial issues, but he has the solution right in front of him, but because of an understanding, a wrong understanding of God's word, he continues to perpetuate the family problem. And the solution is literally right there with him. His wife's like, I can handle this. I'm good with this. Just let me do it. And he says, no, I'm the priest of the home. You need to wait until I get it together. And her job is to pray that God will help him get there. And I was like, wow, oh, oh, I must be new age to you, brother, because that's a whole nother level. So when he came home and told me this wonderful breakfast story, I said, hmm, Tehachapi is a nice place. But don't bring that attribute of Tehachapi into this home, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're going to look into this passage. We're going to do a deeper dive and figure out what is going on in the town, in the city of Ephesus that requires Paul to say this. And then also, what is the biblical principle at play here? And it goes just beyond husbands and wives. It's a men and women thing that the Bible has here for us. So go ahead and lead us into that deep dive. So to first kind of understand where this is coming from in this letter to Ephesus, we actually need to kind of understand a little bit about Ephesus. So, um, and I wish I had like actually brought it because I'm not geographically blessed, but Asia Minor, I'm trying to figure out, okay, so if you have Greece on the right-hand side and Asia Minor is across from Greece, and I want to say on the left-hand side, so that means it's going east. Ephesus is a port city, and I had... You have a map in your Bible. You're yeah, welcome. Yeah, but they can't see the map. And so... It's too small for them. I'm saying I wish I had it on the screen. And so one of the things, um, a few, about almost now, like 10, 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to travel overseas and I studied um, the language, the ancient biblical language of uh, Greek in the city of Greece. And one of the really cool opportunities is we got to travel to Corinth, which was also another port city. 
And so when I think about the city of Ephesus and all of these co people coming through and, you know, you have a mixture of people from all over the world at that time, known world, you had, um, you know, different types of merchants, different types of people, beliefs. This is predominantly, the audience is predominantly a Gentile audience. Now, you had some Jewish folks in the mix. When I was in Corinth, one of the things that was interesting was that <clears throat> we wear heels, ladies. The, the ladies, the Corinthian women, as special as they were, would carve their name into the bottom of their shoes so that as they walked, you would know where they were going because they were prostitutes. So it was, if you've been to Vegas and there's those leaflets all over the city, they created the first leaflet like embedded into their shoe. Okay, so Ephesus took it up a notch. Um, and we were, were looking at the, the cobblestones and, that they have found. And Ephesus put like, they carved like a footprint into the, the, the stone. And then they would carve in like a picture of a, of a Ephesian woman. So you would know, oh, like walk this way. Like this is where we're going. This is where the ladies are at. Um, Ephesus was also in, in, in that culture because there was high idolatry and it was polytheistic, so you had a lot of, um, you know, all of these gods. And one of the, the main gods was, of course, um, Artemis. And she was the, go the goddess, um, if you guys have ever heard of, what is it, Xena warrior princess? So she was like the first Xena goddess warrior. She was like goddess of the forests, the hunt, and fertility. Now the interesting thing about her is that they would pray to her, of course, for, for the ability to be fertile and to have children. And um, she would send diseases to women, but then you would also pray for her to reverse the diseases that were sent, right? Well, that's kind of an interesting dynamic. And uh, the, the carvings of Artemis, she often has um, more than one set of breasts, okay? Because she's, you know, fertile. The thing about Artemis also is she swore that she would never get married. So she is very much like, hey, you do as you please and give into your passions. And so that contributed to the culture of Ephesus that you're going to do as you please. You're going to... Um, uh, have relationships with folk, as many as you want, right? And so then, um, you, but she didn't have children, but she's like, you go ahead and you have children and you do your thing and all that other kind of fun stuff. And so then when we get this letter from, from Paul and he's writing to the Ephesians, Ephesians is a very unique letter in, in comparison to many of the other letters that Paul wrote because he actually doesn't address the Ephesians. So we are actually taking this as um, probably that it was a very universal letter to all Christian Gentiles. And so um, he is doing two things in this letter. He's, he's laying this beautiful theology about Christ as the ruler and sovereign Lord, and then also how that impacts our daily life and our household ways of living and being. So there's like a lot of household quotes in the letter to Ephesians. And so Paul is raising the standard because he's talking to a group of Christians that are used to, and it's fair, right? Because you are in a culture where hedonism and giving into your passions and experiencing all that you want to, you can walk down the street. I mean, imagine you're walking with your child and your child already knows, you know, 
at a young age, oh, footprints and a picture of a woman, okay, we know which direction that prostitute is going as opposed to that prostitute where she lives. And so all of these things are, are shaping the culture that these people live in. So if you get converted to Christ and you understand now this, this whole new relationship, Jesus has touched your heart, but your whole worldview has been oriented to hedonism, idolatry, passions, all this other type of stuff, marriage, was, you know, oh, okay, that, that's also why there's this language like love your own husband, respect your own husband, wives respect, or wives respect your own husband and husbands respect your own wife. Well, the fact that you have to say specifically that, that means that you're out there sowing oats with whomever and marriage is, it could be a very loose construct. So Paul is writing this letter and he's saying, okay, not just to the Christians at Ephesus, but to Christians throughout that whole environment that are exposed to this Greek, Roman um, culture that is pervasive, that you have to literally unlearn one way of how to do something. And then imagine being the Christian on your block and all of a sudden, you stop participating in certain temple activities. You stop participating when your buddies used to go to the town square and y'all know what you were doing and you're like, hey, I'm, I'm not gonna go this time. You can't go to the brothel with us anymore? It was the bathhouse. Brothel, bathhouse, you know why we were going, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but, but you don't, you're not going to do that anymore. We're not doing that anymore. Like my house found this guy named Christ. Wow. Who who died on a cross, which was embarrassing and and de uh, degrading, and so it is reworking. And so Ephesus, this letter is now coming out of this place of, okay, what does this new society of Christianity look like? How are we gonna raise the standard to where Jesus Christ is? And what does this mean for our daily life? So as we go through, it, keep all of these things in mind because it's these principles, not, and we also have to keep in mind that Ephesus is still a patriarchal system. But a patriarchal system doesn't necessarily mean a chauvinistic system. And so you can have this patriarchy, all the chauvinism stuff is just the extreme version built off of hate, built off of, I think I'm better than you, I think that I am superior, and that is why you should submit to me. But also this culture is now saying, what Paul is saying, okay, we've got to put some order to this. There, like, there, there has to be some order, there has to be some stability, and Christ is always in his earthly ministry. He raised the standard, and when he was on earth, and his disciples continued to say, okay, because Jesus really, he couldn't talk about every single situation, right? But he had church leaders that came behind him, his disciples and his apostles, who understood the mentality of a kingdom of love and said, okay, now we're gonna start putting some meat on the bones and we're gonna raise this standard. So let's look, let's start with the men first. Switch it up a bit here. Starting with verse 25 of chapter five. And quickly while you're turning there, just a quick highlight of what's going on in chapter five. The first seven verses were called to walk in love. Verses eight through 14 were called to walk in the light. And then in verse 15 through 21, we're asked, we're asked to walk in wisdom, the wisdom of the Father. So then we get to this marriage, as Taylor said, where Paul is trying to raise the standard of living and we come to the men and it says, husbands love your wives, which is very intentional, as she mentioned, not loving someone else's wife, not loving the women, the prostitutes, all this stuff. You need to love and pay attention to your wife, um, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, and that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives, emphasis again on your own wife there, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Goes on, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So let's, let's talk about what he is asking us to do as men here. If, you, if you're reading this full thing, you realize if men are supposed to be like Christ, and the analogy is Christ to the church, we are the church. We respond to the love that Christ has shown us, correct? I'm pretty sure if we had the time today, there are so many powerful stories of what Christ pulled you from, from what you used to be. When you didn't care about going to church, you didn't care about praising him. Some of you should have been dead. Some of you should be, should had all these horrible diseases and God has brought you through. Some of you are going through things now and only way you were able to do it is because the strength of God. I think it's safe to say we all are responding to the love that Christ has given us. Are we good with that? Can we say that? So as a man, the stakes just got raised. The woman's submission is based on the response to the love that the man is supposed to show that's supposed to be the love of Christ. Yikes! I love my car. She'll tell you. What's my saying? What's my favorite saying? Um, the, I would rather that it happened to me because I can heal, but the car cannot. That's right. I can rest in a broken leg, it'll heal eventually. Scratch on the face will heal. You hit my car, man, that's like four or five hundred gone. And, and, <laughs> and my, that's a good mechanic. <laughs> my opinion is, oh, it's not, just a car. It's just a car. We can fix any broken thing. He's like, that's $500. And I said, but you have your health. He said, nah, man, hit my, take my arm. I can get a new arm. <laughs> so the call here, the men, it's safe to say with all the historical information here and all these brothels and all these prostitutes, the men valued women but not necessarily loved the women. And think about the things you may value according to the things you actually love and are willing to die for. And it's a call for men. First and foremost, you have got to live your life and get your life to the point where you are fully submitting to the will of Christ. And Christ is filling your life and guiding you and moving you in whatever you do to the point where the woman sees you and says, man, that is a godly man. I don't mind being with him. I may actually listen to what he says sometime. It's not a call to say, do as I say, woman, because the good book tells me so. And I heard some of the reactions when I first said my statement about her not submitting to scripture. So I'm like, mm, felt a little neck turn and all this other stuff. Uh-huh, I caught it. But it is a call for the men to actually, it is hard, submit our will and make sure it is in the will of God. Let's look at, just briefly talk about the life of Christ. We're going to follow this analogy, what, what it's saying to us. We, we look in the life of Christ, we know he was born, we know at 12 he stood up in the temple, did his thing. There's this long gap. Then 30, boom, he's on the scene and he's on his ministry just doing his thing. And we look at this life of Christ, we look at God himself becoming man, walking on earth, having all power, and yet all powerful God says, I'm only able to do this by the power of my Father. So you're probably thinking, well, what does that have to do with me? I'm not, you know, raising the dead and doing all this other stuff. So let's say jo Jesus' job and his career was his three-year mission to save us. So you're thinking, single man, and eh, maybe one day I'm going to get married, do my thing. 
I'm talented with math, I'm talented, I love numbers, I love building things. Whatever it is as a man that you love to do, work with your hands, get dirty, build things, whatever it is, that thing that God gave you that you do well and no one can take from you as a man. Like you know you are good. When you wake up in the morning, you're like, the finances may be funny, but you're like, at least I know I can do this. And I am good at that. And they, they can't take that away from me. And when I'm walking in the street and I'm doing what I'm doing, chest out, you can't tell me nothing because I know I am on fire because I am good at that. This is calling us with that thing we're good with, that career we love chasing, to make sure it is fully submitted to God. You are not doing it on your own power. God gave you the ability to do that thing that you know you are good at. You need to acknowledge him. Come on, man. We, we have to. And it's hard because when you're good at something and you get with your boys, you're like, yeah, man, I love to play sports. I love to, I love to play basketball. Like, man, I just dropped 30 on that guy. Nobody could stop me. You know how it is it when you get to the like barbershop. It was more like three points. Exactly. Yeah, more like three points. But you know how it is we get to the barbershop or wherever it is, we start cutting it up and we start talking trash and, and the story gets grander and grander and it really happened. Yeah, you weren't racing and passing people in your car. Your, the light just changed and the other person wasn't paying attention. Uh, what happened at the job, no one else was paying attention. You just caught it. But yeah, I, I rolled up in there and I fixed everything and everyone was like, woo, he's amazing. You know how we do. We, you know, we, we, yeah, I pat myself a lot of times as you can tell. This is asking me and forcing me to say, when I want to puff myself up, am I acknowledging that God is the one who's given me this ability? Because Jesus did it. Jesus is God, and Jesus still stood and said, I'm only able to do this under the power of my Father. God himself acknowledges the Father. Who am I to say I did this on my own? So that's where it starts. It starts long before you're even married, long before you're even looking. Are you doing the daily task as a man, making sure when you wake up in the morning, acknowledging God, what would you have me to do? Show me what you want me to do, Lord, because I want to serve you. Now there's also something here. We look at Jesus, the example of Jesus. Jesus was extremely driven. He stayed on task. Jesus knew when to take a break. Come on now, men, those who love to work. Jesus himself, after the feeding of the 5,000, what did it say? He had to kind of get away. Get in the boat, take me to the other side. There's multiple stories. The crowd surrounds him. Jesus is like, this is too much. And he kind of vanished through the crowd and they were all like, what's going on? So as a man, while I'm doing me, I need to take the time to know when I need to pull away and recharge. Because when Jesus recharged, he always recharged and started to pray. Like, Lord, the folks are draining me. I know I'm amazing. Because there is a danger as a man when you are so good and everyone tells you you are so good and you just keep giving and giving and being good and amazing and amazing. And next thing you know, I haven't seen my family in a while because I'm so good and the job needs me to go on this business trip to save the world again. Yeah, it feels good to be the superhero. Why do you think superhero movies do so well today? We love that. It's awesome. But we still have to acknowledge that as a man, I have got to submit everything I do to the will of God. That is the only way I can truly love her. Because Lord knows I drive her crazy. <laughs> but it is this daily submission where we're able, I'm able to get close to be like, I'm sorry. I was a knucklehead. I'll let you put your arm around Three months later, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that pride, I tell you. But this passage is a call for men to make sure everything that you do is bathed in the Holy Spirit. Because when you are submitting to God, then you can love that other person, can love that wife to the point where I say, I can die for you, and I'm okay with that. It's a call to me to live a certain way where she will respond like we respond to Christ for what he's done for each and every one of us. So let's talk about uh, the ladies. The ladies. What you got for us? This Hope it's a lot of submission. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, um, yeah, it's a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But I want us to step back for a moment. We had a beautiful children's story. 
And we saw Jesus beat up and kicked around and spat on and disrespected and then a crown of thorns put on his head and then he had to drag his cross to Golgotha and then he died. Praise the Lord, he rose, right? Amen. 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 We serve a living Lord. But it doesn't matter how many times I hear the story of what Jesus did in that week where he gave his life and then how he gave up to it. That story, and it's like, it, it's like a children's story, and I sat there and I like was getting emotional because of the fact of what Jesus did. A, a deep, um, transcendent type of love that we can't really even comprehend that was self-sacrificial. So then we're translating that to this text, and there is what Jesus did there, it is literally higher and better than anything. So when Paul is now making this analogy, right, and just as we... It's one of the things in our church that our church sometimes still struggles with is salvation by works, right? Like, I'm, I'm going to go ahead. I don't know if you all struggle with this, but some folks believe that they need to be vegan in order to be saved, right? Okay. Um, I guess they, David said that they censor this. You can eat shrimp and still make it to heaven, okay? Because that's not really what the whole thing is about, right? Um, but the point is, I know, right? They're going to like censor me and be like, she did not say that. Backspace, delete, delete, delete. It's not about your diet. It's not about all of these other things. It is literally because of us being moved by even a child's depiction of what Jesus did is still so completely profound and so moving that I would argue the day that we treat it ordinary is the day we need to fall back on our knees and ask the Lord to reignite that relationship with us because we don't understand how flawed and how messed up we are. And he said, I don't care how jacked up you are, I am going to love you. And I'm going to love you first. And then all we're doing as the believer is is believing what he did and saying, I accept you, Jesus Christ, by faith, and then everything that I do in my life is but a reflection of the profound, overwhelming, tear-jerking love that you had for me that I can't even comprehend. And that's, it's like sin is so overwhelming. We sin even and we don't even realize it. So it's like, you can have the best vegetarian, vegan diet, and like an egg never passed your lips, but you're still at fault for something. We all are still at fault for something in ways, you know, um, we had a professor, um, his daughter was learning how to be potty trained, and um, his, he is brilliant professor, Old Testament, um, it was his specialty, and he came in one day, and his, because he's brilliant, his wife is brilliant, and now these children are like little bite-sized brilliant people, right? So she went into the bathroom, and she came out, you know, kids are so precious, they like, I'm not wearing any pants right now. And so she ran out, and she got her dad, and she said, Daddy, Daddy, come see what I did. And then he's like, I know, that's good. He's, she's like, no, come see, come see. And then she said, I made death. And she, she went to the bathroom, and, she's, and he, because of how he had been teaching her, she looked at her poo and decided, oh, see, that's a product of the stuff that my body doesn't need. And she said, I made death, Daddy. And I was like, you are like way too young to think on that level. <laughs> way too young. But that is what our bodies and this world is afflicted by sin. So when we have this perfect being that steps into this, 
space and says, I'm going to give all of myself for you, and all you have to do is respond. That is what, uh, when we come now to this married relationship analogy, us ladies, we are, the step was already taken towards us, and we're basically saying, yes, I accept it. I accept your love, I accept your devotion, I accept all of these things that you are doing, but it is hard, and these are not easy words to read to say that um, you're submitting to somebody, but we have a few, I want us to go back to the Old Testament, because first of all, we have the story of Hosea and Gomer. And even before Paul wrote Ephesians, there was a living example of this type of sacrificial love. Okay, girlfriend literally stepped out on him multiple times and then had children by other people and then brought them back home. And Hosea said, I will take care of them, I will raise them. And then he continued to have children with her. And, and God is like, that's how I am with you. You can step out, you can do these things, I stay here, I will be here when you get back. And not only that, God told Hosea, go find her. So God is like, I'm going to go find you. And I will still be here, I will still love you, I will still treat you with the same amount of respect. It doesn't matter how many men you've slept with, I'm still going to take you back. And to, for us to wrap our minds around that is even profound. Because, you know, how does Hosea walk down the street with his chest puffed up when everybody knows, I was with Gomer last night. And he's like, I'm still going to love her. And Jesus is the same way with us. Satan's like, yeah, I had so-and-so last night. And Jesus is like, but they are still my child. And that is profound. But that is the, the saving work of Jesus. And so when we come to this now analogy again, it's not a perfect analogy, because there's some words in there that you know talks about, you know, save her unto yourself and all this other type of stuff. And we do have to admit and realize, ladies, that um, <clears throat> there is no man no human being that can save us. That is done by Jesus Christ alone. Ain't no man gonna save me. As much as I love him, I do not get my salvation in Jesus because of him. He, okay, he can do whatever he's gonna do. Jesus and I have our relationship, so if he falls by the wayside, he's we pray the Lord that I don't fall by the wayside too, right? And so we have to always keep that in mind. But it is one of those very tough things to say, submit. So I had to go back to the Old Testament because I have to put some, because I, as I told you, I, I'm pretty strong-willed and I can pretty much think for myself. And I have no problem. I've got a lot of words. I have no problem sharing those words with you under any circumstance. I'm like, you know, I have to sit there and like, you know, reel it back in, throttle it back. And so I had to go back to the Old Testament because I was like, you know, well, we've got to have some um, tangible representation of uh, what this woman who, even though while she's voluntarily submitting to another man in this uh, marriage relationship, because we have already understood that this is not a chauvinistic relationship where I'm going to dictate to you and you're going to, like, have my dinner ready by five foolishness. Like, if you want to have your husband's dinner ready by five, knock yourself out um, and enjoy dinner and then invite me over because I don't have dinner ready by five. So thank you. Um, but 
it, it is not this, you know, like he was saying, this Barca lounger, um, put my feet up and then you take care of me and you are my servant. This is a partnership. This is, uh, because it's elevated to what Jesus is doing, it's raising and it, this type of married relationship should look distinctly different than anything else in the world. So I went to Proverbs 31, and we oftentimes have, we've heard this sermon, you know, we've heard people preach about the virtuous woman and all these other types of things. So I went back to it, and I, it's kind of a long text, but, so I'm not going to read all of it to you, um, but you can, you know, go home and read it for your Sabbath afternoon readings. Uh, but it says, I'm going to read a few things. It says, um, who can find a virtuous woman? She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. And then it starts going through, she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out. There are times when it says, um, strength and honor are her clothing, and it goes through these different attributes. And so I started putting these attributes in my own language, because I, I can do that, because I've gone to school long enough. Um, and so it says, for some of the things that I pulled out, and you're gonna pull out things as well too, that this married relationship, and even the Jewish, culture was a patriarchal system. However, this is a partnership that exists where she blesses her home. And imagine she is going about doing the work that she is doing. And people are like, oh, that's so-and-so's wife. She is a blessing and a reflection of positive attributes in her community and her she brings respect to her husband. Her husband brings respect back to her. I like this Proverbs 31 because I can get down with her. She has a strong work ethic. She's business-minded. And she evaluates good investments. She literally runs a business. She went out one day and saw a field. And she's like, huh. That's a good business venture. And then she went out and she bought the field. It doesn't say she went back and begged her husband for the money. Clearly, she has her own money and finances where she can manage that on her own. And she doesn't need a co-signer. She can do it on her own. I like this kind of woman. She's marked by strength and graciousness for the poor and those who are marginalized. So I see a woman who, as she's going about her business, she has a constant eye out for those who have less than her. And she takes time in her day to stop by and to say, do you need some water? Do you need some food? Are you taken care of? Those who are under her care, because she's running a whole household, she's taking care of her business needs, she is probably only sleeping five hours a day because it's night constantly in the text, but she makes sure that everybody under her care is well cared for and she is not negligent in duties. So she is making sure that the people that work for her, that live in her household, that it's not, oh, I'm sitting up here all prissy and I'm looking down with condescension, I think I made up a word, but whatever, um, on others and saying, you do for me. And she's making sure it says when the snows come, because you all don't know about that, we do in Tehachapi, that when the snow comes, she's not worried. She's like, I got this. Why? Because I've been preparing, because I have forethought, because I knew that not just I need clothes to stay warm, but everybody in my household needs clothes to stay warm. So she is thinking constantly, holistically. And she's got these wonderful qualities. Um, she's got strength. She has dignity, a sense of humor and wisdom. And these last two stuck out to me because I too, uh, yeah, you can work hard and all that other kind of good stuff, 
but the ability to know how to laugh and to have a good time appropriately and to to crack jokes and to like you know you can work hard but then you can like you know take yourself Oh, seriously? You know what I mean? That's what we did at pastor's meeting that one time with Callie, who initiated it. It got 10 times crazier when he sat down at the table. I was just about an innocent bystander. And then this last one, wisdom. She knows when to speak, how to say it, and how to communicate it the best way so that it can be received. So when we talk about hus uh, wives respect your husbands, it's like, yeah, you can say whatever you want to, but do you need to? And one of the things that I really appreciate, my parents have been married for 40 something years, I think. And my mom and I were having a conversation a few years ago, because she got, I ended up getting married two weeks after my parents' anniversary. So it's always like exactly two weeks later, um, which helps me remember that I need to get him something. Uh, so I was like, yes. But we were having a conversation and she said, I was sharing with her some frustrations I had with him. And she said, the first years are always the roughest. She's like, but learn from me. My mom got married when she was 21, and I got married when I was like 28 or something like that. That sounds, that sounds like some good math. Um, and she said, I was younger than you when you got married. Um, and so she said, I used to just like say whatever. And she said, learn from, from, learn from me because not everything that you need to say should be said. And then also, especially um, within African-American communities, treat your men with respect because they are constantly humiliated and downtrodden upon and they experience prejudices in ways that non-men of color do not experience. So don't let your husband come home and feel less than. Make sure that you are the type of wife that is building up your husband. Make sure that even if he does something crazy, don't address it at that moment. Like, depending on the severity, right? Like, use your good common sense. <laughs> but depending on the severity of it, like, take your time, cool yourself down, and then have a discussion about it. Because she's like, keep your husband intact. You don't have to just fire back and be sassy and be fiery and just let your tongue fly. And I see in this a woman, in, in Proverbs 31, a woman who understood that intuitively or you know, developed those skills eventually over time that you don't need to just, just because you, you can bulldoze somebody doesn't mean you should bulldoze somebody. And so the last thing was that stood out to me was that her children call her happy. So not only is she a woman of respect and that her husband clearly gets to go to town and shoot the breeze with his buddies at the gate um, while she's working, uh, but She's the type of person that's pleasant that her, her children are just like, mom, you're a wonderful person to be around. You're, you're kind, you, you, you know how to laugh and to care for us and to nurture for us and all of these other types of things. And so it's not an easy order for women as well too, but it continually shows how this dynamic and this partnership works, that each person has their strengths and that they bring these things together. And so, ladies who might not be married, because Callie now tasked us with preaching not just to the married folk, but to the single folk. So now the single ladies. Oh, the single ladies, right. Um, I, don't, I don't know that song. That's the only part of the song that I know. 
What type of man are you looking for? Are you looking for the type of man that is a reflection of Jesus Christ? That is willing to love you first and then you are merely responding to that love with respect and that the actions that you do for that man are the reflection of the outpouring of that response of love? Or did you kind of do what I did for a while? Like, I kind of maybe, like pastors do date. I mean, I got with him. Um, it's, it's not like we're so holy that, you know, we don't have attractions and things like that. But I may or may not have, but probably did, date some guys who went by like, they had the title Christian, but they were some bustas. <laughs> and I remember I was going through like this time in my life and I was just like, and, and I've been, you know, career long pastor in, in clergy. And honestly, if I can be real with you all, that some of the guys that I was dating, I knew were not a reflection of Jesus but I liked him. And then I was like, well, you know, they, they can, um, what, when it was with one person, I was like, well, they understand and they respect the fact that I'm a pastor, but it wasn't the type of person that, hey, a, a little thing of coming home and having Friday devotions with, or being able to pray with when something gets tough together. And I knew that that wasn't a capacity within that individual. And so it's like, okay, ladies, like when we are looking for these guys, uh, we have to look for the type of guy, like not, oh, let me go out there and find him and then I'm going to reform him. Mercy. <laughs> it ain't your job to reform nobody. You can't change a man. You can barely change yourself except by the Holy Spirit working in your life. So I don't know what gave you the idea that you could change somebody else when you can barely get your own stuff together. And when I went through my whole process, I remember I spent, I took some time off from dating and I spent time in prayer and I wrote down, this might sound weird and a little self oriented, but based upon my, like how I'm hardwired, I was like, I think a guy like this would probably be like a good fit for me. And it was very different than the guys that I had been dating. And I'm not saying that this is like magical power in the note that I wrote and I stuck in my Bible and then I met Eustace. It, there was nothing magical or mystical about it, but what happened is that I prayed about it, I stuck to it, and I started crossing people off the list who weren't gonna fit with me and what I knew what God wanted me to do. And trust me, the great thing about our story is neither one of us wanted to marry a pastor. <laughs> Ironic, right? So true. So <laughs> when, um, I met him, or when, our, when our, one of our friends mutually introduced us to each other, and they said the two qualities that, uh, why they thought we would be good together was, um, um, you guys both love basketball, and you're both pastors, so you should have, like, so much to talk about. <laughs> Wait, really, dude? Really? That's and it? And then oh. went to you and said the same exact thing. Said the exact same thing. So... Eustace and I met, and his friend is taller than me. Yes, this big, and no, then he's not. okay, it's like that. No, we can look eye to eye. No, all right? he's not. He's, he's, not si he's over six feet. He's taller he not than over you. Six feet. Okay, well, anyway, I'm not six feet, but he's not over it. So when no. I was told about Eustace, um, the the height descriptions I did feel. 
uh, really made him look like a tall man in his heart. So when I met him, I was like, you ain't, you ain't as tall as I thought you were gonna be. <laughs> like, oh, oh boy. So we laugh and say, oh my goodness, like, you know, uh, about us being pastors and all that other kind of stuff. But it wasn't that part that made us gel. It was the part of, I complimented him, he complimented me, and it worked. Mm. Praise the Lord, it worked. But this is also what I have to tell the single ladies. Be the type of woman of Proverbs 31 now. Don't wait until you get married. So while you're looking for that kind of guy, make sure that you're the type of woman that possesses those qualities now. Because one of the things, gossiping is one of my pet peeves. One of the things I like about the Proverbs 31 lady is that she was so busy she didn't have time for gossip. She didn't have time to be filling up, just running her mouth about random stuff that was unimportant or talking about random people. And then at the end of the day, the other thing is, when we're looking for our relationships, is that my story, our story, it's all uniquely different, and there is no recipe to find that person. There is no like, like, unless like God in a vision tonight tells you to write down some qualities on a piece of paper, don't listen to what I did this morning and then go home and then write some qualities in a piece of paper and then stick it in your Bible and then, you know, do what fits you. Do what works for you and then understand that we all have our own way of getting to that person. Amen. And as we just bring this to a close, just a reminder what this passage is asking us to do as men and women. Men, even young men, teenagers, start building the habits now that will allow you to be able to submit to the will of God. It seems so cliche, but man, it is the only way you can make it. I could go on about my bad dating decisions because I was just looking for somebody. They told me they'd hire me if I had a wife. I was like, I'll find one then. I'll find one. And it took a long time. Lord have mercy. It took a while. I married him. He had a job. (laughs) He's always had income. I did not wait for him to have that job. Exactly. Come on now. (laughs) But there's so many pressures that we get, even as Christians, you have the folks who'll see you at the church that say, oh, you're you're a nice young man, you're a nice young woman, when are you going to get married? And some of you, marriage is not even on your radar, and you may be past the age that everyone says you should get married, and it's okay. The key and the important thing in this passage is Christ is the head of the church. Men, get as close to Christ as you possibly can so you can reflect his love, so you can care about the less fortunate can care about uh, those who have, those who have not. You can be mission focused on Christ. He can guide your career and all your paths. Ladies, get as closest to the Lord so you can reflect that Proverbs 31 woman who can do all these amazing things by the power of Christ. And And has a supportive husband. Amen. And a supportive wife. Because you get to that point, and this passage is asking us that Christ be the center of it all. Christ is the center of the church. He's the head of the church. He's the head of the marriage. He's the head of our individual lives. Without him, this all makes no sense. We're just wasting our time just going through it. So to go back to the title and to answer the question, what's love got to do with it that Tina Turner gave us? Everything. Everything. And it's a love-based Christ that is the foundation for all this, all of our relationships. And I don't know about you, but I thank God for that. I thank him for that. So we just want to wrap up and pray with you this afternoon. Uh, Thank you so much. It's been a blessing to be here with you. And I I grew up and was raised Oakwood. They said, you got to tell the people to do something when you finish up. (laughs) You got to ask them to do something. 
So I would just ask, as we're about to pray for you, if it is your desire, and I'll keep it simple. Simple's easy. Lord, continue to help me submit to your will so you can work everything out. Relationships, jobs, careers, future marriage, whatever it may be. I need you to come in and work that out. I ask that you stand with me as we're about to pray. And I would dare bet that there are some of us who still struggle with the idea of that initial submission in the first place. And if it's your heart's desire, like, Lord, I want you to come in and to fill this void that I keep trying to fill on my own. If that's your desire, you grab a hold of your pastor and you let him know. It's like, I want to know how to submit. If I've, I've never done this thing before, I struggle with it. Please help me do this. The rest of us, we're standing, we're asking God to just help us be this image of love that he's given us in Ephesians. Father, again, I thank you for your word. Thank you for my wife. I thank you, more importantly, Lord, for your love for each and every one of us here today. Father, some of us have miraculous stories of how we shouldn't be here, but we're standing in response to your love and we're asking through the power of your Holy Spirit to continue to fill our hearts with you, continue to guide us, continue to work on us, especially those who we have a hard time giving up. We want to be, we're standing because we want to submit to you, Lord. We want you to fill our lives. We want you to fill our marriages. We want you to be in the midst of our careers. We want you in our homes, Lord. Help us to be the example of you because the world needs that example. There are those all around us watching and they are looking for something. And we know that something is you, Lord. So we're standing asking for your Holy Spirit to fill and touch our lives and continue doing it. Continue to allow us to submit to your will so then we can submit to each other and love one another. We thank you, Father, because you are so good and loving. In Jesus' powerful name I pray, amen. Amen.